Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. Did you find some eggs? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so did my boys. I went to Easter sunrise service this morning. It was cold. <laughs> but Christ is risen. He is risen. Amen. Let's join together and stand as we open our service today. Got a song we've been introducing for the last few weeks. Not with that voicing, though. We're going to try this one. Oh, much, much better. God so loved, he loved the world that includes you and I together, that he sent his one and only son to pay the price of our sins, that just by believing in him, we can be saved. Let's join together and sing
cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. All right, so this is like a happy day, right? Friday, it's kind of a sad day, right? We're, we're celebrating, so it's not like Jesus died Friday, you know, two days ago. But we're celebrating. And, and, and Christ took a brutal beating. He laid into the, the grave. He was completely dead. No questions about that. But today's a happy day. Today the, the, the women went to the tomb, and the tomb is empty. So we're singing some, some fun, upbeat songs here. Don't be afraid to bring some joy to the day. This is why we are Christians, because Christ overcame everything the world could give him. Amen. Found in you.
put together for our youth group HYM. So take a look at this. Pilate asked, would you like me to release to you the king of the Jews? The priests had stirred the crowd and they demanded, we, we want, want Barabbas. Barabbas instead of Jesus. Then Pilate asked them, what should I do with Jesus? They shouted back, crucify him. They placed him in a purple robe and shoved a crown of thorns on his head. We beat him. Spit on him. Ripped the skin on his side with a whip. Mocked him and nailed him to a cross. They shouted, if he truly is the Messiah, let him take himself down from that cross. If he can do that, then we will believe in him. But God had a bigger plan. 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 At noon, the darkness fell across the whole land. At three in the afternoon, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani. Then with a final loud cry, he breathed his last breath. As evening approached, he was buried in a tomb and the opening was sealed with a large rock. The earth began to shake. The vampires died. Some sacrifice was made as the heavens rose. the story end. At sunrise on Sunday morning, three women went to bring spices for Jesus' body, but something had happened. The stone was rolled away. Jesus was not there. Where was Jesus' body? Someone must have taken him. They went to the tomb to see for themselves, and an angel appeared. Don't be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here, for he has risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there because he is alive. Because he is alive. He is alive. When Jesus appeared to the disciples, they were able to see him, touch him, and feel his wounds. This day forever changed the world because our Savior is alive. Our Savior is alive. So our Savior is alive. Our Savior is alive.
There you go. Try that. Ooh, good. That works. I hit the button on the bottom. Don't you love technology? 200 years ago, pfft. I love technology. It just doesn't work for me all the time. Yeah. Often in time, on our service times, we take individual requests from people that have issues and needs and matters of concern. It's very interesting, when Jesus was risen from the dead, the people who went to greet him at the beginning had no expectation of him rising from the dead. They brought spices for his burial. When he was crucified and wrapped in burial cloths and put in a tomb, they did it hastily because the Sabbath was ending and they had to get away. They, they couldn't delay it at all. So when the women came on the first day of the week, Sabbath is Saturday, and they came on the first day of the week, they had zero expectation of doing anything but preparing a body for burial. When he appeared to them, what's fascinating is they may have had all kinds of issues and questions and things they wanted him to do for them. But the first order of the day was to fall at his feet and worship. And all the other issues were going to be taken care of later in other ways. So often when we bow our heads in prayer, we come to the risen Lord and say, I got a list. I want you to do this. You got to get to that. We need help here. Here's my list. Amen. Today is a day for worship, for awe. I don't know if all of you, many of you who are my age or around there, have been with family members or perhaps very close friends at the moment that they died. Not just going to a funeral for somebody and it's all done, but you were there at the moment that death occurred. And for me, watching my mother die was really the transformational moment of my life. Because something happened in the spiritual realm that I could not explain and I had no words for. For several years, I struggled to understand that until a friend of mine who was also 17 said, Jesus is risen from the dead. I use this one. Understanding that God has a better plan. That line in that video that we showed, we, we have stub toes and lost jobs and difficult relationships and pain and agony and questions and suffering. But God has a bigger plan. He has a better plan. And sometimes those things are answered by community. Sometimes they're answered by technology. Sometimes they're answered by waiting. Sometimes they're answered by miracle, but God still has a bigger plan. And ultimately, that's what Easter is about, the bigger plan. It is true that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave him. He delivered him. He sent him. And his death on the cross opened the way for us into heaven, freely without penalty on us. That's really what grace is, a gift. 
And the way into heaven is not merely so that we get to enjoy heaven forever and ever. It is so that we get to enjoy God forever and ever. So today is a day to fall at his feet in worship. And all the other issues will take their place, but God has a bigger plan. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, whenever we encounter you, so often it's with a list of things we want you to do for us. We bring to you our needs, our questions, our thoughts, our struggles. And that seems to rise above every other matter in the entire world between us and you so that you will get about solving those issues. The amazing thing about Easter Sunday is the men disciples all went off to do their own jobs and go away and struggle. The women were the ones that came to do a task, to perform a service. But in their midst, you appeared. You rose again, and they did the right thing. They fell at your feet to worship. On this Easter Sunday morning, with all the other things going on in the world, the tragedies, the difficulties, the questions that are massively large, you have a bigger plan. And your plan is life and light. Your plan is to glorify yourself. And today we fall at your feet to worship. There are still so many things we don't understand. There are questions that we have. Even on the day that you ascended into heaven, they worshiped and some doubted. And even that was not condemned. You're big enough to welcome us even with our doubts. So we gather here along with believers around the world and set the other issues to the side to worship you. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Flower City Work Camp is this week. Our church is responsible for providing lunches for two sites one day this week. If you are interested in donating anything towards lunch, please talk to Paula Merrill today. We're looking forward to another fantastic year at Flower City Work Camp. Spring has barely started, but summer is around the corner, and that means Vacation Bible School will be starting soon. August 16th through 18th will be our Vacation Bible School. If you're interested in volunteering or have questions about Vacation Bible School, please see Paula Merrill or go to pcf.church and click on Vacation Bible School. That's what we have going on this week. Join us online for more information and other fun things. We'll see you there. Any children want to go to Children's Church? And I don't know if they're doing an egg hunt yet or not, but Mrs. Hogue and Mrs. Merrill have taken... Any kids that would like to go, if you want to stay and listen to me talk, you're more than welcome to. I brought my Christmas presents for my sermon today, but we'll get to that in a second. Question to start off my message this Easter Sunday is, what is your center? A couple of, uh, a couple of weeks back when I was preaching, I kept using the term, you have Jesus at your center. And I use that over and over again, and I kind of realized that, like, that's just a thing that I say in church. I don't really use that anywhere else. It's one of those church terms. And uh, so, so the next four weeks, we're going to be discovering what it truly means for Jesus to be at your center. But in order for us to truly understand that, we kind of need to, to look introspectively. Look at ourselves and see what is 
our center. So if I were to go and I were to find your three closest friends, what are the five words that they would describe you as? It's a question for us to ponder here together. And think about that for just a second. If I am thinking of myself, which currently I am, the first thing that I came up with is I'm a carpenter. At 16 years old, I decided to get out of doing what I was doing, slave labor at a restaurant. And, and jump into the field that I was interested in, and, and it's taken me to where I am today. I'm a carpenter. Our profession is ingrained in who we are at our core. Our center of who we are is ingrained in what we do for a living. What's one of the first things that you meet somebody? Hi, how's it going? Hey, what do you do for a living? It's one of the first conversational topics that comes up about our identity. I love playing sports. I specifically like playing softball in the summer and volleyball in the winter, something to keep myself active. I try to be the best sports player that I can be. In fact, I like sports so much that I coach all of the teams that I play on. That way I know I get a spot. <laughs> it takes hard work and it takes dedication to play a sport and to play it well. You have to be intentional about how you do things. Otherwise, you'll just be another person. And when I play a sport, I want to be the best that I can be. That's another piece of who I am. I'm a hard and dedicated worker. I've, anytime there's been an opportunity, I've given up more of my time to make things happen. I was taught that by my parents. That is an attribute that a lot of people see in me from the outside. I am a husband. I'm a father to three sons. I'm an uncle and a friend a son and a brother. The relationships in which I live my life are an aspect of who my identity is. So what does your list consist of? Because the one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is, oh yeah, by the way, I'm a child of God. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ who is my everything. But is that the top of your list? So consider your identity for a moment. Is it your career, your income, your status, promotions at work? Is this the things that we strive for and we work our hardest for every single day of our lives, centering our lives on what I can do to better my work life? Or is it the relationships that you have around you, either with a spouse or with your family, your children? Are you focused on dating other people? Are you focused on our sex life? Are you fo focused on finding Mr. or Mrs. Right? Luckily, I already did that. She's back in the sound booth. For me, not you. Are you focused on your relationships around? Are you focused on your appearance? I obviously go get a haircut every single week. I make sure that I have the same do. Actually, I haven't been to a barber in uh, a long time. But sometimes our focus is on our, our appearances. Do the, we wear the right clothes? My wife told me that I need to get rid of half my wardrobe because I don't wear it. Do you fit in with the people that you are around? Are you well manicured? Are these the things that we focus our life and our attention on? Do you focus on your identity, figuring out who you are as a person? Or your gender, or your orientation, or any of the things that are going on in today's world? Is this your main focus of your life? Or are the skills your athletic ability, your intelligence, your 
the way in which you carry yourself, is that the most important thing of your life? See, all the things that we've just talked about for a brief minute, they're very important. Don't get me wrong. I, I think that every single one of the things that I've mentioned is extremely important. And all of these things are realities of the world that we live in. All of these things are realities of the relationships that we all carry. These are all the battles that we all face in some way, shape, or form as we make our way through our life. And the question today is, which one of these areas is your life centered into? Colossians 2, 7 says this. My life is rooted in my faith in Christ, and I overflow with thanksgiving for all he has done for me. My life is rooted in Christ. We've got flowers that are starting to bloom. The thing that happens with flowers is if I take this flower and I rip it out of the ground or I cut it off at the ground, it may look beautiful for a short time, but very, very quickly, it's going to start to brown and to die. Because without the roots, without the, the essential part of this flower, the part that nobody wants to look at, the part that is not important to anything except for the very life in which the flower needs to thrive and to live, if you cut it off from that, if you cut your roots out from Christ, and we're not rooted deep into who he is, that shows up in our life. My life is rooted in my faith and in Christ, and I overflow with thanksgiving for all that Christ has done for me. Now, here's another slight example. Here's my Christmas present part. So, at some point, you'll get to stop hearing about my house, but it's still pretty fresh in our lives, so I'm going to keep using it. So enjoy this analogy. But we just moved into our house, right? Three months ago, it's still just. We packed up all of our stuff. We boxed it all up. At the previous, at my parents' house, we had very little storage that I just manufactured storage so that we could store things, Right. So I moved all this stuff, we got it packed into the big U-Haul box, and we brought it over, and we unpacked everything that we use on a daily basis. And we put it all into our rooms, we put it into the bathrooms, we put it into the kitchen. I don't know if your house is different than mine, but if you walk down in my basement, which is kind of scary, the floor, not as scary as yours, Lonnie, <laughs> I've been in your basement. It's not as scary as yours. <laughs> uh, if you go down in my basement, it is fairly unusable. It is an area that is for mechanics and a little tiny area that I can use. Well, the, the area that's about five feet tall, all of the stuff that we don't use on a daily basis is all still boxed up in the same box we boxed it in three months ago, and they're stacked four and a half feet high, some places all the way to the ductwork, because we have all this stuff, and we don't need it. So I just, I, I went down, apologize, Paula, I went down, and uh, this thing, so... At our old house, we never had the big high chair that Levi was sitting in before our breakfast. We always had the one that mounted on a chair because we didn't have much space. This thing, I don't think we've ever used it. No, no, it doesn't fit my message. We have never used it. <laughs> we, very, see? we very seldomly use this high chair. But yet, it is still in our basement. Currently not. I might throw it away on the way home. The next thing, uh, I bought this thing. I remember walking into Toys R Us. This was our first game system. My parents did not allow us to have a game system growing up. We had to buy it with our own money. I know, cry for us. 
So the thing about this uh, particular one is we got new ones and we replaced it, um, which is fair and totally valid. Then I was like, you know, I got the hankering to play some Sonic on the old retro controller that my, gran my grandmother in Cincinnati used to have set up for us all the time. So I went and I got this out of the attic. This was like years ago. I won't take it out for you, but there's no power cord in here. So I put it back in the box and I put it back in the attic like anybody would normally do. I moved it to our new house. You know, I probably could go on Amazon and buy a new, a new power supply. Haven't done that either. This once was something that was so sought after in my life. So it brought so much enjoyment. And yet it sits in a tattered box with no power cord. This is the last thing that I found. I have one of these right here. It goes with me everywhere I go. There's way too many photos on it. I don't know why I still have this. One of the worst part about it is that this was set up, actually we were given it uh, from my wonderful mother-in-law. The worst part about this, sorry if I'm embarrassing you, the worst part about this is that it came with a bag, it had a printer for pictures and all this fun stuff, awesome. I actually brought this over and I left it on the first floor for a good couple of weeks. I said to Paula multiple times, we need to go through this bag, decide if we want to keep it. I went through this bag. I decided to keep this. I put it back in the bag and I carried it down to the basement with all the rest of the junk that we're never going to use again, and I set it down. At one point in time, this was a great camera. At one point in time, this is all you had, unless you wanted to use film, which is weird now. Or cool, I guess it depends on how you look at it. At one point in time, these things were well used and they were important to what we have. But the one thing about stuff is that it always gets old. Sometimes the old comes new. Fanny packs are still a thing. I don't know why. No, thank you. I lived through them the first time. <laughs> okay. Um, the things that we seek after in our lives are going to fade away. I have a short video for us to watch quick. I've seen teammates baptized in my hands. I've seen grown men cry in my hands on my shoulder. I've seen all of these things that these guys have everything the world can offer them. And they sit there and they weep to me because it's not enough. You can keep chasing your dream. You can keep chasing your job, the money, the fame. You can chase it all you want. But without the blood of Christ inside of you, it is all nothing. I was scrolling through Facebook, as I so love to do when I'm doing nothing else but losing my brain. And this video comes across my Reels feed. Derek Carr is an NFL player. His brother was drafted first overall by the Houston Texans, the first year they were ever in existence. And all the reason that matters is because he got absolutely annihilated because they were a terrible team. And his brother came along behind him, and he was drafted into the league. And he went to the Raiders, and he plays pretty well. I won't say too much, Chris, sorry. He's now the Saints quarterback. Unless you want Nathan Peterman, then... Okay. So, Derek Carr has reached the epitome of sports. He is the starting quarterback for one of 32 other human beings in the entire world share the title that he has. He may not be the number one or two or top five quarterback in the NFL, but just so you know, in case you aren't aware, he's made a lot of money. One of those things that we normal people that are sitting here chase after. He's been around locker rooms with 53 other men, 52 other men, because it's a 53-man roster, and these other men have each earned plenty of money. 
they have take, been, been able to go from many times absolutely horrendous upbringings and be thrown into the spotlight because they can run a football really fast and they can catch the ball really well and they can win games for all of us to enjoy. They have reached the epitome of what it is to be in an amazing life. And yet what Derek Carr's testimony is, it's not enough. The money is not enough. I can't catch enough touchdowns to make myself be able to have pride in who I am. I can't score enough goals. I can't get the accolades that I need in order to fill the hole inside of me. And these are the things that we put so much time and effort. These NFL players literally play 17 games a season, unless you make the playoffs. 17 games a season. You know how long the season lasts for them? All year long. They get a few weeks off around now. And pretty soon all the workouts are going to start up again. And they p focus on their craft so much. And yet it's not enough. Derek Carr has seen grown men cry on his shoulder. Because the things that we chase after, the things that we center our identity on, you can't get enough of them. The Sega Genesis is going to be old someday. The brand new car that I drive well, it's going to get rust. We live in Rochester. The brand new house that I just spent three years of my life working on tirelessly. If tomorrow, I was going to say a fire, but that's too possible, and I just don't want to. No fire. If tomorrow a tornado came down the street and wiped out my house, what was it for? What am I living my life for? I just got my assessment. Rachel, I got to talk to you. My house increased by $150,000. And yet, if tomorrow a tornado rips it down, it's worth nothing. Yes, I have insurance. That's not my point. What is it all for? What are we chasing after? Just like this stuff, life here as we walk it today is temporary. But the one thing that I know and the one thing that I want everybody in the world to know is that life with Jesus is eternal. Why do I place my faith in Jesus? Why should Jesus be the center of my life? Why, when I go to ask my friends, should the first thing that comes to mind is that, oh, him, he's a follower of Christ. Oh, yes, he also does some other things. He's a stud softball player. Best carpenter I've ever seen. But Jesus is the top, the center of who I am. Now, I say all this, and very much so realize I have so much work to do in order to have Jesus be the top thing on my list. But I believe in Jesus because the way that Jesus lived his life, as we read the scriptures, the way that Jesus lived his life, the way that he encountered other people was so profound. The grace and mercy that is just completely ground into who he is at his core is something that I want to emulate. Today is a celebration. Today is an exciting day because my, our, the world's Savior, he came and he lived a perfect life. Something that none of us possibly could do. And with profound grace and mercy throughout his life, he gave up his own life as a sacrifice for you and for me. But that's not the end of the story. 
Rising again, he overcame death. Something that every single person in this building, in this community, in this world cannot do. Because Jesus is God among us. It's my desire that in my life, I am understood first and foremost as a child of Jesus. Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless. As you stand before him without a single fault, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached over all the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. I saw a friend post a video of, of a person who grew up Catholic and had a poor experience growing up Catholic. And I don't want to discuss any of the other realities of the world, but this was their personal experience, and they, they looked poorly upon God because what the church has done in their life. We don't place our faith in a church. We don't place our faith in, in this church or any other churches that are around the pastor of the church, the leaders of the church. We don't place our faith in them. We're all necessary. We're all necessary because we've made this organization that needs to continue to move. We place our faith in a living God. One of the things that, that was very misconstrued was the, the, the feeling that churches love to present that it is our responsibility as to why Christ is on the cross. It's our responsibility as to the bad person that we are. It so much as says that we were enemies of God in this scripture. But yet again, that's not where the story ends. Because when we place our faith in Christ, none of that matters anymore. That is all gone and wiped clean by the blood of Christ. Christ did not get up on that cross because I asked him to. Christ got up on that cross because he knew he could only save the world. This is why I place my faith in him. And I want to close with this last moment. We talked about this passage not too long ago. But Matthew 16, 13 through 16. And Jesus comes out to his disciples and they're separated by themselves. And these disciples are just getting into ministry. And Jesus, when he came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked to his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? 
They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus turns the tables a little bit here. He says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And the strong believer that Peter is, that likes to throw out the answers as soon as he possibly can, blurts out, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So that question is pointed to you. Who do you say that Jesus is? How do you show who Jesus is in the way that you live every single day? Is there grace and there mercy? Absolutely. Do we all need it? I do. Who do you say that Jesus is? He is the risen Messiah. He is the risen and living Son of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We come to Easter service as a celebration of your overcoming the world. The world period. You did this better than any human being could ever possibly do. With such grace and such mercy, such strength and love, And the encouragement here today is that when we go through our daily lives, are we seeking after who you are? Or are you second, or third, or fifth, or tenth? Or are you even there? Instill within us the desire to to understand you more to give thanks for what you have done in each and every one of our lives. Give us the skills necessary in order to live a life that is holy and pleasing to you. When we look at the things that are going on in our our world and we look at them through a lens that is Jesus Christ, the sun is still shining. I'm still breathing. Today may be painful, but tomorrow's coming. Friday's good because Sunday is coming. Lord, help us to center our lives directly on who you are. In your name, amen. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. We invite you to all stand and close our worship service with one more song and celebration. I will sing forever of your love. Come down, lift my hands to heaven, shout to praise his life. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love.
we close our service today, I just want to remind, listen to the words of Jesus. Who do you say I am? It is our job as the church to not just be in this building, but to go outside these walls to proclaim who Jesus is with our words and with our actions. Be the hands and feet of Jesus today. Happy Easter. Amen. I will sing forever of your love. Come down, lift my hands to heaven, shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down.